Chapter 4 I was shivering by the time he made it up the sloping hill to the front porch, chilled through and through. The snow had gotten in over the tops of my boots, and my feet were wet and frozen. Doug knocked loudly on the front door. Red stamped his boots up and down on the planks of the front porch, knocking clumps of snow off. He smiled at me encouragingly. I guess I looked pretty pitiful. Doug knocked again. Shannon, buried inside her big down ski jacket, had wrapped her arms tightly around herself for extra warmth, but she was shivering too. The wind whipped around the side of the house, carrying wet snow with it. I reached up a gloved hand to feel my nose. It had no feeling. It was numb. Frostbite city, I thought, unless someone opens that door now. We heard footsteps inside the big house. They sounded louder, and finally the front door swung open. Whoa. The man seemed surprised to see us. He was tall and broad-shouldered. He had scraggly brown hair that looked as if it hadn't been combed in days, and a short brown beard. He was wearing a red flannel shirt and baggy blue jeans that had been patched at one knee. Well, look what the cat dragged in, he bellowed, eyeing us one at a time. Our car, Doug started. You see, the storm. I think Doug was too cold to speak. Well, move it. Get your buns in here, the man said in a booming deep voice. Hurry, you're letting in the cold. We rushed forward, bumping into one another in our eagerness to get inside. Once we were in, the man slammed the door and locked it. I'd been staring at the bright snow for so long it took a while for my eyes to adjust to the room. There was no entrance way, just one enormous front room with a cathedral ceiling and a big glass skylight at the top that provided a bit of light. There was a big stone fireplace against the far wall opposite a second floor balcony, and in it several logs were burning, crackling loudly and sending up tall orange flames. I'd never been so happy to see a fire in my life. Woo-wee, you guys look frozen, the man said. Get out of those wet boots. Drop your coats over there. He pointed to an alcove to our left. And come warm your bods in front of the fire. We obediently followed his instructions. Ava, Ava, he shouted. Get in here, gal. We've got unexpected company. We were heading home, but we couldn't make it through the storm. Doug finally managed to explain, pulling off his boots, his gloves still on. Our car doesn't have a heater, and... Come on, get your frozen buns over to the fire. The man interrupted, helping Shannon pull off her coat. You're a pretty one, he told her. I like redheads. I saw Doug make a sour face. He never liked it when anyone came on to Shannon, even teasing. We don't mean to intrude, Red said, shaking the snow out of his hair. Hey, no problem, the man said. Eva and me have plenty of room. This place used to be a ski lodge before they went and built a new highway. You kids are welcome to wait out the storm here. Thanks, Shannon said, hurrying over to the fire. I don't think I could have stayed another minute in that freezing car. I'm Lou, the man said, kicking her boots up against the wall. Lou Hitchcock. Where are you kids from? Shady side, I said, examining my wool socks. They were soaked through. Except for Red. I'm from Brockton, Red said, stopping at the back of the long leather sofa that faced the fire. I'm hitching a ride with these guys. I met them up at Pine View. The ski lodge? Lou asked, scratching his beard with two stubby hands. Before Red could answer, a young woman walked into the room, wiping her slender hands on a dish towel. Well, there's your nibs, Lou said, smiling. This is my better half, Eva. We all said hello at once. She looked younger than Lou, about twenty-five or so. She had very fine, curly blonde hair that looked bleached, and she wore metal-rimmed glasses over blue eyes. She was wearing a red flannel shirt, too. It looked like a tiny version of her husband's, and she wore straight-legged brown corduroy slacks and brown work boots. I certainly didn't expect visitors today, she said, sounding more than a little confused. She had a tiny voice. Seeing her next to Lou, I thought of a mouse next to a bear. We introduced ourselves, repeating our names first for Eva and then for Lou who insisted on vigorously shaking her still-frozen hands. These turkeys were driving in the snow. Got stranded, Lou said. Guess they don't know the roads have all been closed. I told them this place ain't exactly a holiday inn, but we can make them comfortable till the snow stops. Ava got a concerned look on her face, but she didn't say anything. I had the feeling that she felt uncomfortable having four strange teenagers pop in from nowhere. I knew I would, but all she said was, Lou, go put on some coffee. You kids look frozen. I sat down on the white shag area rug, leaned my back against the leather sofa, and stretched my feet toward the fire. Man, did that feel good.
I looked up at Shannon, who was huddled beside Doug on one end of the long couch. She actually had a smile on her face, the first one I'd seen since we left the ski lodge. Man, oh man, look at her snow, Lou said, his voice booming off the high wooden rafters as he paced back and forth in front of us. Listen to that wind. Some of the drifts are six feet deep. Unbelievable. He stopped pacing in front of Shannon. You're not a bad kid. Did I mention that I just love redheads? I couldn't tell whether Shannon was blushing or her face was just red from the cold, but she looked pretty uncomfortable. Lou was really staring at her. I prayed that Doug would ignore it and keep his temper in check for once. These people were going to put us up for the night after all. It was taking a while for my brain to unfreeze. I stared into the orange flames as if hypnotized. Everyone else in the room seemed to disappear for a bit. I guess I was exhausted from the long, frightening drive. Everything went out of focus and I lost myself in the warm, flickering glow. When I came out of this comfortable daze, I suddenly remembered my parents. Do you have a phone? I asked Lou, who was sitting in a worn leather armchair at the far end of the couch, thumbing through a tattered magazine. Right, my parents, Shannon cried, jumping up from the couch. What am I going to tell them? I'm going to be grounded for life. Don't worry, we'll think of something, Doug reassured her, pulling her back down beside him. Lou pointed to a low table underneath the balcony. Phone's over there. You can give it a try. The lines were messed up this morning, but maybe it's okay now. Doug, Shannon, and I scrambled toward the phone. Doug got to the table first, picked up the receiver, and listened. They're static, but I think it's working, he said. He started to dial his parents. I looked over toward the fire. Redhead stretched out on a couch, his head on the padded arm. Aren't you going to call home? I asked. It can wait till later, he said. They're not expecting me till the middle of the week, so they won't be worried. He raised his knees, reached forward, and pulled up his socks. One of them had a large hole to tow. I can't hear it too well, Doug was shouting into the phone. He kept assuring his mom that he was okay. Shannon went next, and I could tell her parents were giving her a pretty bad time. Ava came in with a big pot of coffee and a loaf of banana bread. I don't think coffee ever smells so good. I hadn't realized it, but I was starving. It was my turn to use the phone next. There was so much static on the line, I could barely hear the dial tone. Finally, I could hear the phone ringing at my house. It sounded a million miles away. You have reached the Monroe's, my mother's voice came through the static. I'm sorry, but no one is home right now. I don't believe it, I told Shannon. I got the tape. Shannon shrugged. Maybe it's not snowing this hard back in Shadyside. I waited for the beep and left a message, trying to shout over the interference on the line. When I hung up, I realized I felt a little down. I'd really wanted to talk to them, to hear their voices. They were usually home on a Sunday evening. I had a creepy feeling that something bad had happened to them. I get this feeling a lot. I'm just a worrier, that's all. I can't help it. I know I'm childish. But there I was in a strange house somewhere, 200 miles from home. I didn't even know where exactly, in the middle of the worst snowstorm I'd ever seen. And I just wanted to talk to my mom or dad and tell them what had happened. I felt cheated, I guess. Abandoned in some small way. The banana bread and coffee cheered me up a lot. I think we were all starving and hadn't realized it. We wolfed down the bread, and Ava came back with another one, which he also wolfed down. It was really nice of you to take us in, Lou, Red said, still stretched out on the couch. Shannon and Doug were pressed close together on the other end of the couch. I had returned to my place on the rug in front of the fire. Don't mention it. Lou put down the magazine he'd been leafing through. I saw that it actually wasn't a magazine at all. It was a gun catalog. You guys like to hunt? he asked, following my glance. Yeah, you bet. My dad takes me hunting all the time. I love it. Lou laughed for some reason. His dark eyes seemed to light up. He pointed above the fireplace to two deer heads mounted on the stone chimney. I hadn't even noticed them till then. I guess I was too dazzled by the fire. See those beauties? I bagged both of those one morning last fall. He raised his arms into a pretend rifle, aimed up at the deer heads and shouted, Kaplow! Ah, said Shannon, making a face. Lou laughed again. Nothing like hunting, he said, sharing at Shannon. But I understand why he made that face, young lady. It's a real man's sport. Yeah, that's what my dad says too, Doug said, nodding his head in agreement. His black, curly hair was matted down from the wool ski cap he'd worn all day, but it glowed in the firelight. He lets me fire his hunting rifle when we go out. It has a pretty powerful kick, but I can handle it. Of course you love hunting, Doug, I thought sarcastically. Doug was a pretty good guy. I mean, 
He was great looking with that dark hair and that really neat smile that made his eyes crinkle. And he had a good sense of humor and everything. But that macho side of him just turned me off completely. Lou stared at Doug as if sizing him up. So you can handle a gun, huh? Doug nodded, staring back at Lou as if accepting a challenge. Please, please, Doug, I thought. Don't start up. Don't try to prove anything to Lou. Lou looks pretty macho himself. I watched Lou walk over to a large, glass-encased gun rack on the wall in the corner. Doug and Red followed him. I glanced at Shannon, but she was staring up at the deer heads. Look at this beauty, Lou was saying, handing a large revolver to Doug, who took it and dutifully admired it. And see this hunting rifle? Sheer perfection, Lou exclaimed, an enthusiastic grin under his beard. Nice, Doug said. That's a real beauty. He aimed it up at the deer heads and pretended to fire. Whoa, careful. I keep them all loaded, Lou said, replacing the rifle in the rack and closing the glass cover. Just in case. Just in case what? I wondered. You can never be too careful with guns, though, I'll tell you, Lou said, leading the two boys back to the fire. This old boy I knew, name of Harv. Harv Dawkins. Harv likes to hunt in the snow. Crazy jackass. I'll bet he'd even go out on a day like this. Said it was more challenging. What did he hunt? Snowman? Red asked, then laughed his funny high-pitched laugh. No, deer, Lou replied seriously. Harv always said he could see the deer better in the snow. They couldn't hide as well. That's what he said. But all Harv made one little mistake, you see. I mean, it may be easy to spot the deer in the snow, but it's a heck of a lot harder to spot a hunter. Know what I'm saying? Doug nodded and chuckled loudly. Red was starting to look very uncomfortable. Shannon just stared grim-faced into the fire. I think she was enjoying the story as little as I was. Well, I imagine you guessed the ending already, Lou said, sort of bobbing up and down on the heels and toes of his work boots as he talked. That's right. Poor Harv got his head blown off by some fool hunter. Lou threw his head back and laughed. Doug joined in, shaking his head as he laughed. Red looked back at me and rolled his eyes, as if to say, What's with these characters? I didn't see the funny part. This Harv was a friend of yours? I asked. Yeah, Lou replied, and for some reason that made him laugh even harder. Can you believe it? He asked, shaking his head. I mean, can you believe that crazy jackass? What a hideous story, I thought, staring at Lou's gun rack behind him and suddenly feeling another chill. Red was still peering at me. I think he was reading my thoughts. Doug was just shaking his head, a wide grin on his face. He headed back to Shannon on the couch. Maybe we'll all go out hunting later. What do you say? Lou asked, looking at Red. Nothing doing, Red said quickly. I'm staying right here by the fire. You couldn't get me to go walking in that snow for anything. Lou made a face. Red's answer didn't seem to please him. I suddenly felt chilled again despite the fire. Chilled and very uncomfortable. Maybe it was just a long day. Maybe it was the guns and Lou's story. The way he thought it was so hilarious that a friend had been killed. I got up and walked over to the large window that almost covered an entire wall. The wind howled in the dark night without letting up, blowing waves of snow against the glass. Don't let yourself get worked up about Lou, I told myself. He's okay. He was nice enough to take us all in, after all. I scolded myself for being a snob. You're just not used to people like him, Ariel, I told myself. So he makes you uncomfortable. Well, he was just trying to be friendly. He's obviously uncomfortable with us, too. That's all. I turned away from the window and walked into the kitchen. It was big and warm and smelled of apples and cinnamon. It looked like a ski lodge kitchen with dark wood paneling and exposed rafters overhead. A large, old-fashioned range stood against one wall. Something was boiling in a round copper pot on the stovetop. Beyond that, I saw a cozy breakfast nook with a long wooden table, wooden cabinets on three walls, and a large, curtained window that looked out on the back. Ava was at the double sink, washing the coffee cups we had used. Hi, I said uncertainly. My voice startled her. I guess she'd been thinking about something. She looked at me over the rims of her glasses. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, she said, reddening slightly. Ariel, I said. I'm sorry to bother you, Ava, but I'm still cold. Do you think I could have a cup of tea? I'll be glad to make it myself. No trouble, she said, drying her hands. Now, let's see. She walked past me and reached up to open one of the cabinets. She stood on tiptoes and started to sort through the contents of each shelf, looking for the tea. Can I help? I asked. No, I'll find it, she said. She closed the cabinet door and opened another. It suddenly struck me that this was extremely odd. 
I mean, if this was Ava's kitchen, why didn't she have any idea where the tea was? Was I reading too much into this, or was it definitely weird? That Lou, he never puts anything back in the same place twice, Ava said suddenly, as if reading my mind. Okay, here it is. She reached up to the top shelf and pulled down a packet of tea bags. Is Earl Grey okay? Yeah, fine, I said. I gave her a warm smile, but she avoided meeting my eyes and quickly walked over to the island counter in the middle of the kitchen. She's very shy, I realized. I took a seat on one of the benches at the kitchen table and watched her put on the tea kettle. This is a great house, I said, struggling to make conversation. She didn't turn around. It's so big and drafty, she said, her voice barely reaching me. At that point, Doug came in. I was glad to see him. I wasn't having much luck making conversation with Ava. What's happening? he asked. I wondered where you went. Well, you found me, I said smiling, just having some tea. I have to run upstairs for a bit, Ava interrupted, tucking a flap of her flannel shirt into the front of her jeans. Just pour the water when the kettle boils. Thanks, I said looking at Doug. Ava left the room silently. She's so quiet, Doug observed. She and Lou are a weird couple, don't you think? I guess, I said. I started to say something else, but stopped. Doug and I both cried out in surprise when we heard the snap of a gunshot right behind us. Chapter 5 What was that? I cried, my heart pounding. For a brief second, Doug appeared as frightened as I was. But then he quickly recovered. Good old Mr. Macho. It sounded like... He was staring down at the floor behind the kitchen table. I turned around and followed his eyes. Oh my! It wasn't a gunshot we'd heard. It was the snap of a mouse trap on the floor. A tiny brown mouse was struggling in a trap. The metal bar clamped over its neck. Its little black eyes bulged wide, and its tiny legs thrashed violently, scratching it against the flat, wooden part of the trap. And then, all at once, they stopped. I turned away. How horrible, I said. Doug laughed. It would be so horrible to step into a trap like that, to know that you walked right into your own death. Yeah, a real bummer, Doug said, making fun of me. He walked over to the corner, bent down, and picked up the trap with a dead mouse pinned inside. Like a snack with your tea? Ah, oh, you really are gross, I said, moving my head away. You really are an insensitive clod. That made him grin even more. He walked over to the double sink, opened the cabinet door beneath it, and tossed the dead mouse in the trash can. Well, maybe I'm not as sensitive as you, Ariel. Nobody is. I'd known Doug since third grade, long before I'd known Shannon. we gotten used to talking to each other this way, sort of like brother and sister. I had no choice. I had to be sensitive, I said. I mean, my parents named me after Shakespeare. Your name is Shakespeare? This was a running gag with us. We'd gone through this routine a million times, but we both still thought it was a riot. The kettle started to whistle. I tossed my hair behind my shoulders and walked over to the big stove to make my tea. I'm Ariel the Sprite, I said. Watch how you talk to a Sprite. I could go for a Sprite right now. I'm dying of thirst, Doug said. He laughed and slapped the counter. I wondered if we'd ever grow tired of that awful joke as I carried the kettle over to the cup and poured the steaming water. Then I dropped the tea bag in. Peering out into the darkness beyond the kitchen window, I could see that it was still snowing hard. The sky was black behind the snow-covered trees. The wind continued to howl and blow. I don't know what you're so cheerful about, I said, suddenly feeling very worried. We're never getting out of here. They'll have the road cleared by morning, he said. No problem. I could tell he wasn't as confident as he was trying to sound. Sometimes I wished he would just drop the tough guy pose and let himself be real. But then I thought that there was no point in both of us sitting around butting our fingernails down to the quick. Hey. What's up with you and Red? he asked, deliberately changing the subject then. He plopped down across from me at the table. I took a sip of the tea and burned my tongue. What do you mean? Nothing. I've seen him looking at you, Doug said, obviously teasing me. You know, checking you out. Give me a break, I said. Red's a nice guy. I kind of like him, I guess. The guy saved our lives by finding this place, Doug said, becoming serious. I started to agree, but we were interrupted by another loud noise. This one was definitely not a gunshot or the snap of a mouse trap. It came from the living room, and it sounded like the roof was crashing down. Doug and I jumped up from the table and tore into the large main room. Lou was standing in the middle of the room, a beer can in one hand, looking concerned. Red and Shannon were standing by the fireplace, the orange firelight causing their frightened faces to flicker and glow. What was that, Lou? Ava called down from upstairs. Sounded like it was out front, Lou called up to her. 
He dropped his beer can onto a side table and walked to the front door, taking long, unsteady strides, probably the effect of having had several beers. The four of us were right behind him as he pulled on the big front door. A blast of frozen air rushed into the room as if it had been waiting for the door to open. Lou staggered back, holding on to the doorknob. Then he leaned forward, peering out onto the porch. It's a tree limb, he said, and started cursing at the top of his lungs. He turned back to us. His hair and beard were dotted with large white snowflakes. A tree limb, he repeated. Probably couldn't take the weight of the snow. Please, close the door, Shannon said, shivering. Lou poked his head back out. Another gust of frozen wind invaded the room, bringing a spray of snow with it. It went through the porch roof, Lou called on to us. Lucky it didn't land right on the house. He came back in and pushed the door closed. He shook his head to get the snow off. Let's go pull out of there, suggested Doug. I could use a little exercise. He started across the room toward the coat alcove. Yeah, thanks, Lou said, raising his eyebrows questioningly at Red. You coming too? Yeah, I'll help, Red said, sounding a lot less eager than Doug, who had already had his ski jacket on and was heading out the front door. Lou pulled a down coat off a peg near the door and put it on, fumbling with a zipper. That's strange, I thought. The sleeves of that coat are way too short for him. The three guys disappeared out the front door. Shannon and I went into the kitchen to get away from the cold air. I poured her a cup of tea, and we took our cups and sat in front of the fire. From out front, we could hear the voices of Doug, Red, and Lou as they struggled to remove the tree branch from the porch. I guess we needed a little more excitement today, Shannon said, staring into the fire. It's been quite a day, I agreed. I thought of Randy for some reason. I wondered what he was doing right then, whether he was worried about me. What's to be worried about, I asked myself. You're safe and warm, so why didn't I feel safe? And why couldn't I warm up even though I was sitting directly in front of a fire drinking hot tea? Red's really nice, Shannon said, giving me a meaningful look. I shrugged. Yeah, he's a good guy. We heard a crash outside. The guys must have managed to pull the limb off the front porch. Do you think Lou is, you know, all right? Shannon asked. I could see that she was nervous, so I tried to be cheerful. It was nice of him to take us in like this, I said, but my eyes went to the gun rack in the corner, and I found myself thinking about that awful story Lou had told and how funny he thought it was. A few minutes later, the front door burst open. Doug, Red, and Lou came tromping into the room, their faces red from the cold. I told you to let me pull, Lou yelled angrily at Doug. You got a hearing problem or something? Next time, you can pull on your own tree limb, Doug said. He stared back at Lou, challenging him, standing up to him. Everything okay? Ava called from upstairs. I wondered why she hadn't come down and joined us by the fire. Yeah, I guess. Big shot here is a little problem following directions. He glared at Doug, who twisted his head away. But we got the thing cleared away, Lou shouted up to her. He stamped his work boots to get the snow off. Then he unzipped the ill-fitting down jacket, fussing with some ski-lift tickets that were hanging from the zipper, and tossed the jacket back up onto its peg. Lou and Doug are a bad combination, I whispered to Shannon. Her eyes on Doug, she nodded in agreement. Especially if Lou keeps staring at me like a hungry puppy, she whispered back. You know how jealous Doug can be. Lou's been drinking, I whispered, a lot, I think. That isn't helping matters. We've got to get Doug to cool out, Shannon whispered, or else we could be out in the snow by dinner time. She walked over and took Doug's arm to calm him. A short while later, Lou and Doug had seemingly made their peace. All of us, except Ava, were seated around the fire, eating chili and listening to Lou recount how he had been in a much worse storm than this once, trapped in a cabin with three beautiful women. As he told the story, he stared at Shannon the whole time. Lou disappeared into the kitchen, then returned carrying another can of beer. Hey, you monkeys are so lucky, he said, standing in front of the fireplace, his red flannel shirt untucked in front, his brown hair still damp from the snow and matted down on his forehead. Being caught in a storm like this isn't exactly lucky, Shannon said from one end of the couch. Yeah, but you got in a great weekend of skiing first, right? Lou said, turning around to stir the fire with a raw iron poker. I used to love skiing, way before I met Ava, but I haven't gone in years. That's strange, I thought. There were ski tickets on the zipper of the jacket Lou had just been wearing. Well, that proves it, I thought. That jacket definitely isn't his. But so what? What did that prove? Why was I being so suspicious of everything? Just my nature, I guessed. But part of my problem was that I was suddenly exhausted. I hadn't realized it, but I suddenly crashed. I suddenly felt too tired to move. 
Lou was now talking about some ski trip he had taken years before. His voice drifted in and out of my consciousness. And that crazy fool broke his leg in less than 30 seconds, I heard him say. Another one of his supposedly hilarious stories. I took a final spoonful of chili, excused myself, and carried the bowl into the kitchen, where Ava was busily putting dishes and silverware into the dishwasher. She had the most unhappy expression on her face. For a moment, I thought she was close to tears, but her face went blank when she saw me, and she turned her back to me. I asked if she'd show me where to sleep, and then I followed her up the creaking wooden stairs to the balcony landing. It was much warmer upstairs. As she led me down the narrow hallway, I peered over the balcony railing at my friends below. Shannon had snuggled up against Doug on the couch. Red was poking the fire now. Lou continued to talk, gesturing with the beer can in his hand, his booming voice echoing off the wooden rafters just above my head, his eyes trained on Shannon. I think we put your bag in this room, Ava said, pushing open a door and flicking on the light. I followed her into a small guest bedroom, white painted walls, a curtained window that overlooks the front porch, a double bed, a dresser, and a straight back wooden chair beside it. Watch your head, Ava warned, pointing to the steep slant of the ceiling. That quilt sure looks cozy, I said, cheered by the sight of the heavy maroon quilt on the bed. I couldn't wait to get undressed and get under it. If you need anything, just yell, she said. She disappeared before I could thank her. It didn't take me long to tear off my clothes, pull on a nightgown from my bag, turn out the light, and slide under the covers. The bed was soft and not too cold. The springs squeaked with every move I made, but I was so exhausted I didn't care. At last I felt safe and secure under the big, heavy quilt. I must have fallen asleep the minute my head hit the overstuffed feather pillow. I slept a dreamless sleep for I don't know how long. I don't think I moved. I was awakened by the sound of the front door closing. I sat up, wide awake, and listened. Someone had either gone out or come in. My heart pounding, I climbed out from under the quilt and walked to the window. I pressed my forehead against the cold glass and stared across the porch roof to the sloping front lawn. No one there. The snow was still falling, smaller flakes now. It seemed to sparkle almost too bright to be real. For a moment, I had the feeling that this wasn't real, that it was all just a dream and that I'd soon awaken and find myself where. I heard floorboards creak downstairs. Someone had come in and was walking around down there. I tiptoed to the bedroom door, pulled it open, and crept silently along the hall to the balcony landing. The fire in the fireplace had nearly burned out. Dark red embers popped and sizzled among black shadows that had once been logs. Another loud creaking floorboard, a cough. There were no lights on. Whoever it was had chosen to walk around in the dark. I started to call out, but lost my nerve. Who would come into the house in the middle of the night, especially on a night like this? Who would creep around without turning on a light? I jumped at the sound of something crashing to the floor down there. Was someone trying to wreck the place? Had someone broken in? If all the lights were out, the house would look deserted from the outside. Was it some squatter down there? Someone who had decided to break in and spend the night out of the storm? Horrifying thoughts flashed through my mind. Pictures of masked men carrying bloody hatchets and chainsaws. I shivered. It was cold out there on a the balcony. I decided to get back under my warm, safe quilt. I turned around and started back to my room. I reached the doorway and froze, my breath caught in my throat. Footsteps, coming closer. Someone was climbing up the back stairs.